you end up saying really weird things like, I love mashed potatoes and gravy, <laughs> which I do. And I love you, Lori, or the way we discuss our love of God. So in English, we have this one little word that's, that's asked to, to do a lot of heavy lifting in every direction to the point where, what does my affection for mashed potatoes and gravy have to do with the real love that I experience in my life? Yes, this is our penultimate session. It's fun to use that word in a sentence. Uh, second to the last, and, and I appreciate all of you um, coming out on this strange morning when we find ourselves in a disorienting relationship with the space-time continuum. Although I do notice now in our social media universe there are literally millions of reminders to uh, jump ahead and so on. But I still forgot last night. Lori and I woke up this morning and realized, oh, I haven't changed any of the clocks, but look, luckily it worked out and I showed up. <laughs> no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't miss this. I wouldn't dream of missing this. It's such a remarkable opportunity. I don't think I'll ever forget this, uh, getting this opportunity to commandeer five adult forums in a row. Uh, I, I don't know if this is common. I've only been a part of the cathedral for three or so years. I don't know if this is a thing that happens here, but I am just humbled and thrilled that my little book got to be um, our, our Lenten study here at this session anyway in the, in the adult forum. Uh, it used to be called adult formation, and I suppose it still is, but we all colloquially call it the forum. And because you don't have to even be an adult to come here. So, you know, uh, words matter, I guess so. But here we are, and we are thinking today about uh, the sixth stone. Many of you have been reading my book, and again, if you, if you haven't, the store will be open after our little hour together on Amazon. Paperbacks go for 25 bucks, plus tax, plus shipping if you're not a Prime member. Um, here we'll do it for 20, tax included. And like I often say, I'll even sign it for you because that makes it worth more on eBay. When you throw it down in disgust somewhere in the middle of chapter three and decide to unload it. Um, but, and the hardcovers, uh, I didn't set these prices, but the hardcovers go for $48 on Amazon. And here they're only 30. So there you go, that's the business piece. And I have bookmarks and so on. Um, let me look back now that we're so deep into the process and maybe some of you are uh, here for the first time, whether in the room or watching on YouTube. And a special shout out to my friend Paul, who is ubiquitous here at the cathedral. Every room I walk into, he seems to be there before I get there and is doing something. And he's the master videographer and also is editing these videos. And I also want to mention that all of these videos uh, are on the cathedral's YouTube channel. So next time you're on YouTube, punch in St. Paul's Cathedral, San Diego, unless you want to see the St. Paul's Cathedral in London YouTube channel, which is pretty good too, but put in San Diego and you'll come here and click videos and the first three episodes are already up and Paul does a wonderful job editing and posting those, so thank you for all of that. How do we review what we've already done in just a few minutes or just a minute so that we can get into the work that I'd love to do with you today? Well, there's a section at the end of the book on page 319 for those of you reading along. And that section is a decision I made to kind of, how can I get the whole seven stone path on like one and a half pages or maybe on one page if I use small font? And that's what this is. And so I wanna read the, uh, the first five stone summaries from the seven stone path summary on page 319. That'll be a good way, I think, to remind us where we, how far we've come. So the first stone is wisdom as acceptance. Wisdom begins with acceptance of what is. Acceptance is the decision to stop resisting current conditions. When we move out of resistance and into acceptance, when we unclench our hearts and minds and fists, the foundation for right action is established. 
and doors open through which wisdom can begin moving in and out of our lives. Without this first essential step, none of the other steps are possible. And then stone two, wisdom as surrender. If acceptance means acknowledging the river is flowing, surrender means falling in. The last remnants of our resistance wash away, leaving us in a state of readiness unlike anything we have ever experienced before. By relinquishing strident seeking and combative assertions, we leave room for wider and deeper awareness. Third, wisdom as engagement. Now that we have deepened into the consciousness of acceptance and surrender, we are ready to stand tall and engage with the world in the field of action without attachment to outcomes. Here, we engage in action not as a personal act, but as an act of service. We acknowledge that real transformation on the individual level as well as globally cannot occur without conscious, vigorous, compassionate action. Fourthly, am I losing that one, two, three? Yeah, fourthly, <laughs> wisdom as allowance. We've accepted current conditions, surrendered the ego to our larger purpose, and engaged with life in the field of action. Now we move into deeper accord with the generative intelligence of the universe through allowance. Allowance means aligning, cooperating, and co-creating at the deepest level with the energies already moving around us. We embrace the paradox of action in the midst of inaction, mastering the practice of creative letting be. And then last week, we thought about step five, wisdom as enjoyment. When the first four steps are in full practice, we move into enjoyment, making peace with the material world and genuinely embracing the beauty and pleasure of life through laughter and aesthetic rapture, we continue to emerge from our egoic shell and enter the wider world. We are at play in the field of forms without attachment to any of them. Acceptance, surrender, engagement, allowance, and enjoyment, and two more to go. And I thought today we would just tackle one. Normally we've been doing two per session, but I wanted to maybe slow it down a couple of clicks and think about the sixth stone, wisdom as love, and give us a chance to discuss more of the questions from the study guide, and that goes for next week as well when we will tackle chapter seven or the seventh stone, wisdom as integration, a long and difficult chapter. I had a friend email me the other day and he said, you know, we gotta get together because I don't get chapter seven. I was doing fine. I was doing fine with one through six and then I got to chapter seven and I, I, I need to talk to, to Boland to figure this out. So um, yeah, there is, there is a sense of, of uh, deepening complexity as the book progresses. I'll, I'll just be honest with you. That we start at the beginning with some simple things and then there's what we in teacher speak call scaffolding. And as a teacher, you're taught how to A, start where students are, and then B, scaffold. And that means you, you build one level and then you use that level to see a little further. And then you build, and then you get to that next level. And then from that level, you see further still and so on and so on. But to throw someone in on chapter seven, not having read one through six would be pretty tough, I think. So that's, that's the message I'm getting from some of my readers. I don't know what, how this book hits people. I lived with this book for 14 years as a Word doc, as a manuscript in my computer. <laughs> and I just, I just slept and dreamt and thought about it all the time for 14 years. And so I honestly have no way of assessing whether it's accessible or impenetrable. I just don't know. So the feedback I've been getting from people has been tremendously helpful. So this chapter is about love. And boy, what a word, right? What a, on one hand, what a simple word. And, and what a potentially superficial and trite conversation can often be had, you know, when the Beatles saying all you need is love, um, we all went, yeah. And, and yet you can, you can feel it already how quickly that can just become a trite cliche. 
with no power at all. And yet I was struck by how central the idea of love and loving is at the heart of so many of the world's wisdom traditions, religions, mythologies, philosophies. In fact, the word philosophy, as many of us know, has the word love in it. In ancient Greek, philo, sophia, and philia is one of the forms of love in the ancient Greek tongue, and sophia uh, represents wisdom. And so philosophia means the love of wisdom. So it's right there in the entire project. And so that, and we dealt with some of that in the introduction to the book. So I want to open it up now, and Sterling, you can help me with the mic here if anybody raises their hand. But I want to ask you, just maybe if, if you would help me begin to unpack the different kinds of love. That's where the chapter begins. Because in English, there's just this one little word, and you end up saying really weird things like, I love mashed potatoes and gravy, which I do. And I love you, Lori, or the way we discuss our love of God. So in English, we have this one little word that's, that's asked to, to do a lot of heavy lifting in every direction to the point where, what does my affection for mashed potatoes and gravy have to do with the real love that I experience in my life. So let me ask you if you would just be willing to enter this conversation with me. What are the, it's the first question in the study guide that I'm looking at here. What are the different ways you've experienced love in your life? What are the different kinds of, or the different dimensions of love that you've noticed as you think back on all the experiences you've had? And the second part of that question is, are all those different aspects part of one underlying reality? Or, or, or are we confusing things together that, that, that shouldn't be together? Who wants to talk about love with me today? Oh, please, let's start there. Thanks, thanks Davida. And think, my usual mic training technique, about one inch from the mouth would be great. Thank you. I suspect that for most people it starts with parental love or it, uh, I mean, the child, the, the love of parent. And, um, and then I, I started to think about that last night and I realized at the core of all of that, no matter how it progresses, is caring. That's the word I would use. Thank you, sure. So caring might be the connective thread. I care about mashed potatoes and gravy. <laughs> I care about 57 Chevys, I don't own one. I care about 1957 Fender Stratocasters too. And I listen to some Led Zeppelin and Megadeth and, 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 and some really crazy rock and roll on the way in here this morning. I love that too. I love the bizarre kind of cheesy Celtic mysticism of Robert Plant's lyrics. Who else sings about Gollum, you know? And, and so I've realized I love this music and it's my music from the 70s anyway, so I connect it with my adolescence. So love is this crazy thing, but it's care is a nice way to connect it. Yeah. The whole, has to be the whole. Yeah, it, it, these are all maybe windows looking into the same house. That's what I want to explore with you. Who else wants to share something from their experience? What are the different ways you've experienced love in your life? Please. Well, the, the connection itself or bonding is very central to the idea of love. Uh, say, say some more about that, the connection, the bonding. What do you mean exactly? Uh, well, when you, when there's an arc of that takes you into something else and also brings an aspect of that thing into you, so there is an interflow, inter, interchange between mm -hmm. two elements, and that creates a sense of bonding, and that, the both parties then experience love through that connection. Nice, nice. No, I, I appreciate that. You know, Lori and I watched Maestro uh, Saturday afternoon on, Net, on Netflix. That's the, well, Bradley Cooper says it's not a biopic, but it's kind of a biopic of Leonard Bernstein, the composer, but, but it's really about love, isn't it? It's about the love story of them and the, the complicated nature of their love. And it's one of, in my view, the best movies I've ever seen about music, about the, 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 the madness, the passion, sometimes the shatteringly destructive connection to music and the creative life 
you know, Leonard Bernstein was personally ambitious and also really lucky and also really talented. And, and the love became, you know, this is that, and I'm not, this is above my pay grade, but when does love turn into a kind of pathological obsession that destroys as much as it creates? So through works of art like the film Maestro, um, which connected with a lot of people, and, and, and especially those of us of a certain generation who grew up watching those, those uh, performances on TV of Leonard Bernstein and learned about classical music from him. So that bonding that the artist has with that which they are creating, and then the bonding that all of us have as appreciators of that Mahler symphony, or whatever it is, or Bernstein's own music. Um, who else? Maybe let's do one more. What are some dimensions or different kinds of love that you've experienced? Oh, sure, let's go back there. Try to put it in the right places. Um, it's, well, it's back to the family love. And yeah. when, when my son was born, there was this, such a sense that this is exactly the person I wanted to have in my life. But also, when you give to your child what you felt was missing from your childhood, it, it heals backwards, too. You know, and that, that was, I guess, my first lesson in how that kind of works. <laughs> Can we, can we come up here, Sterling? You'll get your steps in if we do this right. Well, I can't help but think of, uh, you know, C.S. Lewis is the four loves, referring to divine love and family love and brotherly love and romantic love. Um, and he, I think one of the points he makes is that uh, the things that we love in this world, whether it's someone it's beauty or wisdom or generosity, that those are just you know, we'll, we'll look in, at God and Jesus eventually, and those are just rivulets to the fountain. I mean, those are just little pieces that we get, little, you know, shadows of glass that will eventually see the real thing. And he distinguishes between need love and, you know, people who just want admiration or, you know, love to get it versus, you know, giving love. Yeah. That's nice. C.S. Lewis is four types of love remind me a lot of what we're about to think about, which is those, which I suspect as an educated person, he's referencing some of these ancient Greek words that we are about to think of too. But I love that image you just dropped on us about these are all rivulets from the same stream. I was reading in the Upanishads yesterday and there's a, because I'm thinking about making, I do a bunch of videos about different Upanishads and put them on my YouTube channel. And it's been a minute since I posted a video and I was looking through the Upanishads, what's the next one I should do? And I ran across one that, um, I forget which one now, but there's a whole long page or two list that claims, and I wish I'd seen this before, I would have put it in this chapter, that every kind of love you experience, and we're kind of, uh, you know, this is sort of the main, I'm stumbling here because I don't know the words to, with which to express this, but this is kind of the thesis of the entire chapter by the time we get to the end of the chapter. What if, and it's implied in this question, what if all of the, dynam all of the dimensions and, and varieties of love are aspects of one thing? What if the love we feel for our, for our primary relationship partner is a cosmic love of, of God, to use the Western word, you know, in the, in the Upanishads, it's all about Bra Brahman, the, the sacred ground of being, which takes form as us. So when we love one another, that's Brahman acknowledging Brahman. And that when we experience the beauty of the world, that is Brahman appreciating and connecting with itself. And that's, a, I realize, a non-dualistic philosophy that might be expressed differently in different religious traditions. So the four types of love that, you know, the chapter begins with, eros, storge, philia, and agape, I thought that was worth doing as a way of kind of opening up our English language poverty
around just this one word, love. So, and I am not versed in these languages, but I read about them. <laughs> and what I gathered about ancient Greek, uh, Koine Greek, uh, the Greek of Plato and Aristotle and the Gospels, which is different than what they're speaking in Athens today. But in ancient Greek, there are these four different kinds of love, and some say even more. So Eros, I think we all know what that means. Um, Eros was actually a god, too, who um, later in Roman mythology got turned into Cupid. Now, Cupid's cute. It's a little baby, you know, and it's Valentine's Day. And Eros was terrifying. He was like a, he's, like a, he's, he's like an Indian god of the same nature. These are fearsome, dangerous, almost demonic figures who, who, here's how Eros gets you. When you see the object of your love, whether it's a 57 Chevy or a uh, you know, a, a beautiful person that you uh, love or whatever. What happens in erotic love is Cupid's, I should say, Eros's arrows emanate from the love object and enter into your eyes. And then they go into your heart where they cause uh, thea mania, divine madness. So the Greeks were, were sort of interested in Eros, but they also recognized it as a really uncontrollable, dangerous, short-lived, or is it short-lived? I don't know. It's an open debate. Homage or homage, I don't know. Um, foyer, foyer, we've had these conversations for years, haven't we? English is hard. Um, so that is Eros, and it is, I love how Joseph Campbell describes it. He calls it the zeal of the organs for each other. <laughs> it's like, you're not even really needed for this. It isn't about people. It isn't about connection. And in fact, it's more about ownership. So that's a, that's a powerful human experience, and it needs its own word, eros. Then there's storge, which is that familial love, and that's where we started, and that seems more natural or you could say instinctual, that connection, that bond, and that love we feel for our family group. And then there's philia, which is part of the word philosophy, part of the world, part, part of the, the name of the great city in Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, uh, brotherly love, or that warmth of connection between friends. And that's a whole different kind of love, isn't it, than eros or family love. And it's also the love of, of one's culture, one's tribe, the smell of one's grandmother's kitchens, that feeling of belonging. That needs its own word, too, philia. Um, and then there's, of course, agape. And that, to me, is kind of one of the more interesting ones. It's the word that the gospel writers use to, um, to convey Jesus' message about love. When Jesus talks about God's love for us or when Jesus asks us to love one another, the Gospels, in, and you know they were written in Greek, Greek, the Gospels use the word agape. And agape is very much like the Confucian word li. It's not a love you feel with your heart. It doesn't come from the heart. It's not an emotional experience in Greek consciousness. Agape is the sometimes cold decision the conscious, willful decision to be compassionate, to care for someone, even if you don't like them, even if you actually don't care for them. In fact, worse, even if you are repelled by them, or even if they have addressed you with hostility, to override your natural fight stance and say, I'm going to choose to be compassionate. And I'm going to apply love with my will. And that is a dimension of love that doesn't get a lot of attention in the West. And I don't know, as a musician, as a singer of songs, and, and I know all of you love songs too, you know, the message we all got from all of our pop songs, from Frank Sinatra to Ariana Grande is, is uh, that love is a kind of pathological obsession and an attempt to control other people. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that if you don't love me, I will you know, hunt you down. Stings, it's an immortal song, every breath you take, 
which is the creepiest stalker anthem ever. And whenever I hear it at a wedding, I kind of, my skin kind of crawls a little bit. Love the song. Love the song. But agape isn't People any. Play People play that at a wedding. Sorry? Oh, this is causing reaction. Sorry, what? Sing us a few lines. I don't know. Oh, every breath you take, every step you no, every 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 cake you bake, I'll be I'll be watching you. That's that's the tagline, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> every move. We can edit this out on the video later, right? Yeah. <laughs> the part where I sang the police terribly. Um, so, let me ask you a question then. As you think back on your life, how have these four types of love, eros, storge, philia, agape, you know, erotic love or having a crush on someone, uh, and then family love, and then that warm connection of friendship and bonding with one's friends or one's culture, and then finally agape, the decision to love someone even though you feel like running from the room, how have these four threads woven together? Does anybody want to share a little bit about that? Please. Hi, Robert. Hi, Stuart. Well, um, one of the meditations I wrote for the Latin booklet uh, quotes Abraham Lincoln, uh, in which he says, I don't like that man. I must get to know him better. <laughs> and you right. think about how much compassion that takes to do that, uh, to go past yourself and will yourself to love somebody else, whether you like them or not, whether they, you know, this is the friend who stinks at the picnic or something, I don't know. Uh, uh, at and least you're outdoors. Yeah, right, even if you're outdoors and you can smell them two blocks away, it doesn't matter. Uh, that, that takes a tremendous amount of willpower. And when we are, when Jesus tells us to love one another, it's not a suggestion, it's a command. Uh, and so we have to engage our willful mind instead of our emotional mind. I mean, there are people uh, in the Christian church, some sects of it, who uh, love Jesus on, a, on the uh, erotic level, I think, uh, but we don't. And uh, I, I'm, I'm happy about that, that we engage our, our reasonable minds and are asked to, uh, uh, but you, that's not the question you asked. I think, <laughs> I think uh, the re what's in my own life, uh, I've had a number of times when I've had to look past slights or what I perceive to be uh, insults or uh, people who have ignored me or whatever and, and love them anyway. And uh, so I just, uh, I, I had a, sort of thing up in the air uh, recently uh, that's been going on for a couple of months that I resolved because I read my own meditation. <laughs> that it's all about forgiveness. And uh, so I, if, that's what the, if that's what you're asking about, that's what I, yeah, that's, that's yeah. what I did. Great, thank you. I saw the hand back here, please. How have these different, these four Greek kinds of love woven together for you or connected? I think that what it's done for me is it's given me a very poor self-image. Um, you know, you talk about being Christian. Well, I won't claim to be Christian, though part of me would like to obey this dictum of, of Jesus loving everyone. Um, but when your grandchildren are Jewish, and, you know, there is a Nazi in the neighborhood, it's, I don't know how to behave when I am threatened. I, you know, when there is a political person saying, you know, all these horrendous, uh, fearful things. And, uh, and when I don't like somebody where if, I know if I, instead of being four feet 10, if I were 10 feet four, I'd probably pick them up and, you know, smash them against the wall. <laughs> this is the truth of who I am, and I don't like it. Um, so, you know, I've known a lot of love. I, you know, as a teacher, anytime anyone harmed my students, you know, the, yeah. you know, I went in for it. And I, I, you know, was on many causes and stuff. And, you know, here I am pushing 80, and I'm nowhere near the loving person I want to be. So these... Knowing love at different levels 
it's like, God, I'm going to die and I'm still not the person I want to be. I'm laughing because I appreciate you keeping it real. Um, I, I think that these teachings are aspirational. That's a word I often use, and I've used it here before. That This whole book is aspirational. I think when Jesus says, um, love one another, he's just quoting his own rabbinical studies, right? He's quoting Leviticus to, to love um, our neighbors as ourselves. You know, this isn't some new idea he cooked up. It's, it's part of the perennial wisdom of that's what's going to bind our community together. Um, I was reading today about the way wolves fight. <laughs> Thank you, social media, for the random things I learned. But, you know, when alpha males and, and contesters of alpha males in a wolf pack fight, they fight just to the death. And the wolf who has been defeated will roll over and lay bare his jugular vein to the dominant wolf, who will go in and put his throat, his, his terrible jaw on the throat and not bite, and decide that in this moment, the health of, this, of the pack supersedes my desire to finish this guy off. And so it is, it is, life is so messy, there's so much battle and conflict, but that, that reminds us that perhaps evolution itself favors compassion putting the needs of others over the needs of ourselves and so on. But your examples of Nazis in the neighborhood, I'm gonna have to write a song called that. And it's really good because there are Nazis in the neighborhood. It's not just in 1930s Europe. And that is a serious threat to everything that we're thinking about right now. So I think of these as aspirational, not as I have failed if I don't get to the condition of perfect, absolute, 100% universal love for all beings. If I don't reach that, I have somehow wasted my life. I, I don't know if that's the best read of these wisdom traditions. These are paths. These are directions. What if I just tr keep trying to go in the direction of kindness, in the direction of mercy? I'm always going to miss the mark. I'm never going to get it right. There are going to be moments when I need to take sometimes terrible action to save lives. And so this is the messiness of trying to calculate all these things. So in a book like this or in a philosophical or spiritual conversation, we are simply talking about directional ideals and what are more nurturing, positive, generative stances we know from personal experience that revenge, retribution, and continual burning hate destroys both of us. And we also know from our own experience that mercy and forgiveness saves both of us. I watched most of Ben-Hur last night, and I realized and I hadn't thought of it this way before. What a Christian movie that is. I know it's us. Maybe this is obvious to everyone else, but I always thought it was a movie about Romans and chariot racing. But watching it from start to finish last night, it really struck me. Um, Jesus is hardly in the movie and usually shot from behind. It's all about this other guy. And, but it's constantly the message of, of forgiveness, of mercy, of, of not letting revenge consciousness destroy us. But how we actually get there is just so typical. This Longfellow quote often comes to mind. Let me jump down to... Um, I'm still on the first page of the workbook, uh, number four, under the going deeper section. It says, discuss the Longfellow quote on 217. And the quote is, if we could read the secret history of our enemies, the secret history of our enemies, we should find in each man's life sorrow and suffering enough to disarm all hostility. That's the best explanation I've ever read of how we might start to even inch toward the forgiveness of the Nazi in the neighborhood. The first step has to be they have to stop being a freaking Nazi. It isn't on me. The harm has to stop. And then what leads people into ideologies that categorizes and minimizes and slates for genocide, entire categories of people. My first question to people like that is, how dare you? 
And my second question is, who do you think you are? That you get to declare metaphysically that entire category of people is beneath you. And then I think, what woundedness attracts someone to that conception of reality? That the only way you can lift yourself up is by pushing someone else down. It seems like hateful ideologies like Nazism are rooted, and I'm no psychologist, but are rooted in deep self-loathing, in lovelessness, in terrifying fear, in cosmic alienation. And they just look for a victim to push down. It's the schoolyard bully. And we all remember the schoolyard bully was the most terrified kid on campus who went home to take his beatings all day from his dysfunctional father. And he brought that rage to school and looked for someone shorter and weaker than him or different from him and pushed them down. We know what the roots of violence are. And this question, if we could read the secret history of our enemies, we should find in each man's life sorrow and suffering enough to disarm all hostility. How does that quote land with you? Does, that, does my take on it um, ring true with anyone? Or do you have a different way of thinking about that? If we knew everyone's secret history, please. Come, sir. I don't know if I want to know everybody's secret history. but. <laughs> That's been my experience too. If you talk to someone, you disagree with them. But if you patiently dig down, what's really going on? What's really going on with them? Yeah. Often there's something else. Some, like you said, some deep fear, some deep, you know, fear of mortality, fear of, you know, what it, losing out. There's something that's that's going on. So exactly what you said. If you knew their history, and then it comes down to you were saying earlier about agape being this kind of bloodless thing, but. In the Gospels, when it talks about Jesus having compassion, he feels it in his guts. It literally says that in the Greek, that he feels this compassion in your guts, and that's what he wants us to come to, is to move beyond that cold, by which I agree, that's what we start with, but we want to have that, I understand that fear that you're feeling, that sense of alienation that you're feeling that leads you to this horrible thing. Yeah. To find that one common thing, and we learned that in so much of our anti-racism work as, uh, as white liberal anti-racists, you know, how do I talk to a Klansman? And, and the, the, through some of the training that Lori and I have been through, through the years, it's, you know, you can find that one common thing. It's like, to say to them, you know, I'm afraid too. I remember I had to go to school on 9-12. <laughs> at a community college where there were Saudi Arabian <coughs> foreign exchange students in my classroom. These five Saudi boys on 9-12. And by the way, on 9-13, they never came back to school. They immediately realized it was too dangerous out there for them. And it, I'm embarrassed to say, but what the hell, I'll be honest, I was scared that day. I started thinking about the backpacks they had on the floor. Am I about to die? Am I about to be murdered by a terrorist? Because as you know, two of the 9-11 hijackers lived in San Diego. They lived with a Muslim family in La Mesa, a few miles from my house. They attended a local mosque. They shaved their beards. They took classes at Grossmont College. They studied flying at Montgomery Field right across from the In-N-Out Burger. And you can look up in the San Diego Union Tri Tribune archives, their flight instructor, so there's an interview with their flight instructor who said, yeah, they were really interested in taking off, but they never wanted to learn about landing. Mm. And that's what sleeper cells are, the fact that these kinds of terrorists would embed themselves in our culture, shave their beards, learn English, blend right in, I mean, if that doesn't trigger your fear of immigrants, then you're kind of not paying attention. But of course, then your logic comes in and says, hold on, proportionality. Yes, that did happen. But then you also add into the hopper of your consideration the fact that all of my Muslim and Arab American friends suffered terribly in those years after 9-11, unjustly discriminated against, and worse, attacked. So that, 
I like how you put it just now, Calvin, that, that I was emphasizing agape as a, as a uh, intellectual choice and then applied through volition or the will and without much heart or gut. But I think you're right, and one of the ambiguities for me, and I, the chapter explores it too, uh, we believe, I don't, I don't think there were any tape recorders around, we believe that Jesus in his day-to-day -day life spoke Aramaic, which is a Hebrew-related language that was familiar in his tribe, but it's also very likely that he knew Hebrew as an, edu edu as an educated Jew, and probably like a lot of people in the labor economy of that time, knew enough Koine Greek to do business, like my Spanish, you know, enough to negotiate at the Swami. So was Jesus trilingual? I don't know, there's no evidence of that. We're just speculating. And so I looked up the word for love in Aramaic and it's, it's huba, H-O-O-B-A. So did the gospel writers translate Jesus' actual word huba into agape, thereby distorting its meaning? Its meaning. Because huba in Aramaic means to kind of burn, to kind of long for, and so it, that sort of upends what I said before about agape. So maybe Jesus isn't just talking about an intellectual choice, but maybe we can combine them. And it's up to our rational minds and our discernment and our, our prayerful discernment now to kind of work our way through scriptural interpretation. And, and in this tradition here, um, I'm glad the door is always open to that approach. So maybe it starts as a choice, and then after you do it, you, you kind of fall in love a little bit. And you start to feel, once you sort of get over your initial revulsion, your initial fear. But I'm struck by how agape and the, the Confucian idea of li are so connected. Um, li uh, originally meant sacrifice or ritual. And in the Confucian philosophy, Confucius lived, you know, 500 BC in China as the most important voice in Chinese philosophy. And for Confucius, li meant um, to take all of our lofty virtues and turn them into behaviors. Li is about action, not about feelings or even principles, but rather how do you show up? And so in ancient Chinese Confucian society, there was a highly choreographed sense of social interaction, how deep one bows and all of the endless rituals of everyday interchange. But to put it in a more general sense, the rituals of our lives might be the mechanisms that demonstrate love. I tell a little story in the book about, it's called the shoebox under the bed. And you know, my, my mother and father were immigrants from the Netherlands. And so I grew up here in, I was born in New Jersey, but I, we, when we were four, we came out to the West Coast and I grew up in Ventura. And in my childhood, I didn't have any extended family around. It was my mom and dad and my two older brothers. Every cousin, every aunt, every uncle, and all my grandparents lived in the Netherlands. And I didn't know them. I had, didn't have relationships with any of them. I occasionally spent two weeks with a grandparent or a set of grandparents that came over and stayed in our house. They didn't speak English. I didn't speak Dutch. And. I remember a lot about that, but I don't feel uh, a lot of connection with them. And so when I would get a birthday present for my, let's say my maternal grandfather, you know, a little fire truck or something, and I don't know if my mom bought it and said it was from him because he sent a little money, I don't know, but I'm eight years old, I open a birthday present and it's from my grandfather. And my mom says, okay, you need to send a thank you note to your grandfather. And when you're eight, you're like, eh, really? Um, <laughs> I don't really know him, and besides, he knows I'm thankful, like, duh. You know, why do I have to go through this empty ritual? Because that's your big revelation when you're eight, all adults are hypocrites, and, and, they don't, and, they, and they just go through empty rituals all day long. And like, why would I want to participate with that? And my mom would listen to all my objections and then say, okay, just, just, but just do it anyway. And so I'd get a thank you note, and I'd write, dear grandpa, thank you for the red fire truck. It's really neat, I'm gonna play with it a lot. Uh, love Peter, and then lick the envelope and just, it didn't mean anything, right? And so when I was in my 20s, a student at UC Santa Barbara, my mom called me and said, your grandfather's died. 
and I'm flying back to the Netherlands and me and my brother are gonna go through his apartment and all that stuff you do when someone passes away. And she called me a few days later. She said, Peter, I just wanted to let you know, I just found a shoebox under your grandfather's bed. And I pulled it out and I took the lid off and in it were all of your and your brother's thank you cards. And it really finally hit me then the value of those rituals that I thought were empty and hollow and therefore meaningless. But to my grandfather living in the Netherlands who had lived through the Nazi occupation with his teenage daughter, Amy, my mom, who was from the age of 14 to 19. So her whole junior high, high school life was under Nazi occupation. They barely survived, you know, starving. They're frying potato peels and Vaseline toward the end of the war. They used to ride their bikes out to beg from the farmers. The Nazis stole all their bikes. All the radios are gone. All their Jewish friends are gone. It seemed like the world had ended and there was no rescue, no cavalry was coming. And so in that context, after the war, when my mom married my dad and they moved to America, that was always a source of great pride for my grandfather to realize that his daughter was not only surviving, but thriving in California and raising these three amazing boys, the youngest of which was the most amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it was getting a little heavy there. I had to make a stupid joke. <laughs> but that grounded me. In, I finally understood Confucius at the end of that phone call. That maybe those connective rituals that you don't think are all that important. And there's another story, and, and very, very briefly, every day my dad would get home from work. He, was a, he worked uh, at, a, at a newspaper in Ventura. He was, he was part of the printing crew. He wasn't a journalist part of the printing crew, a typesetter, they called it. And he would come home right about the same time I got home from, ele el from elementary school and high school, and, you know, 2.30, 3 o'clock. And my mom and dad would sit at the dining room table, and my mom always had a pot of tea for them. And I wasn't invited, nor was I interested. And so I would just hear the quiet conversation of these two married people. And as I reflect back on my life, now that they're both gone, that happened every day that every day my mom and dad had, every 24 hours they had a standing date. They didn't have to text each other. It's like, when are you available? <laughs> it was just understood that that was gonna be a decompression point in their 24 hour cycle. And that's Lee too. And I wonder if that standing ritual of connection between them and a cup of tea was part of the glue that made that marriage work for 66 years. Those are, those are really powerful examples to me of how love is, is not just this big feeling, it's the simple gestures of kindness and care. And that seems pretty, pretty powerful. Um, finally, as we begin to wrap up here, there's this idea of, of love as, as letting go that there's a story and someone pulled me aside before the session and said that, that bit at the end of this chapter about uh, called Love at the End where we euthanized our dog Boone um, was really emotional. And I remember doing a book event at another place and I, I read that passage out loud. Um, it's a little long, I, don't, I, I won't do it here, but it's just the story of uh, putting down our, our dog Boone and um, 239 to 244. I read that aloud once at the, the very first book event I did. And by the end, um, everybody was crying and I realized I'd made a misstep. <laughs> and, and, and in fact, I got an email from a woman after the event said, don't ever do that again. Never, never read that passage out loud uh, without trigger warnings. And then she told me a story. She said, you know, I drove to this talk today from um, a care center where my husband is in hospice. Mm -hmm. and, and we're gonna lose him any, any hour now, any day now. And it was just so difficult to hear that passage. Um, at, at least give us a, war, a little bit of a warning that you're gonna do it. So I'm gonna give you so much warning, I'm not even gonna read it here. But that reminded me of, of how love is 
again, not clinging and craving as all the pop songs say, but love is an opportunity to be in the presence of that which is real, that which is sacred. Like that passage I referenced earlier in the Upanishads that I wish I had put in this chapter, that your love of mashed potatoes, it doesn't say that in the Upanishad, your love of mashed potatoes and gravy is a form of our love of God. That love of this song, that love of your tribe, that love of your family, that erotic attraction even for someone or something, mm -hmm. that passion, these are all forms of one thing, all mm -hmm. rivulets into the same stream. What if that's true? The Hindu tradition explicitly states that it is true, that all of your dimensions of love are notes of one song, of God's apprehension of God. And that's why we often resort to the word love when we run out of all the other words. God is love. <laughs> and in the end, when we reach that depth understanding of the mystery and the fundamental ineffability of love, we, we, we get to where Hafiz is, and I want to just read the um, Hafiz poem on 253. It's at the end of the chapter, after everything. Hafiz is a beautiful um, Persian poet, uh, Muslim, Sufi Muslim. And this is his poem called, I Have Learned So Much. I have learned so much from God that I can no longer call myself a Christian, a Hindu, a Muslim, a Buddhist, a Jew. The truth has shared so much of itself with me that I can no longer call myself a man, a woman, or even a pure soul. Love has befriended Hafiz so completely. It has turned to ash and freed me of every concept and image my mind has ever known. That is the global mystic manifesto. That's what I get from St. Teresa of Avila, from Meister Eckhart, from Thomas Merton, from Lao Tzu, from Jesus, from Confucius, that when you enter into the experience of love, well, the way he puts it, all of your labels burn away. All of your definitions of self burn away. There's not even you and the beloved. There's just love. And one is, to use his imagery, burned up in the fire of that experience. So love had to be stone six, where all of the previous stones are synthesized and integrated. And next week, when we return for our ultimate or last session, we will do our best to move into the wisdom of integration or unifying all of these different threads together. Thank you so much for your focus and your participation this morning. Good morning. See you.